heard that uh, f from Doug that the need for energy efficiency, uh, more energy efficiency in China, and we heard from uh, then we heard about the fact that there is increased production or, or demand being going on in in from Victoria in China, and then Dr. Xu has a solution. Uh, Dr. Xi has a solution with the sun. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Xi first. Um, are the other solutions better? Are they viable? Because solar power is somewhat expensive. What is, and if they are viable, can they happen fast enough to solve China and the world's energy problems? Okay, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think it definitely is viable. Um, if you look at, uh, okay, if you look at, uh, we talk of energy as a whole, you know, all sorts of energies came from sun, okay? And uh, coal, oil is uh, energy of sun in the past. So it is true. So reserve on the you know, Earth's crust. So now we need to you know, use the sun of the present. And um, of course, I mean, at this moment, is we, we think solar is more expensive. That's, I can tell you, two, two years ago, you know, the solar panel's price was 30% cheaper than today. So the reason the solar panel price is, you know, went up is really is because of uh, demand is far ahead of supply. So this uh, uh, silicon price became, you know, more expensive. And uh, with, with more and more people now, you know, starting investing in the upstream, in, in investing in refinement of silicon. So with more uh, silicon being available in the near future, this solar panel price will come down again more dramatically. Way. So that's why you know, I've just mentioned uh, within less than 10 years, solar power will reach grid parity. Or in a more familiar term, solar power will be able to uh, generate electricity you know, with a generation cost is around 15 to 20 US cents per kilowatt hour. I think if you're talking in California, you know, the present uh, electricity price is around 20 US cents per kilowatt, uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, but by the way, the, you two can jump in too with questions. We can talk among ourselves. But my question to you to pick up on that: uh, Let's suppose that the world that today that solar power were competitive, could the, and we all wanted a solar panel on our roof. Okay. Is the capacity there? Okay. Uh, is, is what? Is the capacity there? Suppose everybody in the world capacity. said, "Okay, I'm going to have a, a solar okay. panel on my roof sure. tomorrow next week." Could it happen? I think it's uh, is is gradually happen because. Uh, if you look at our uh, solar power community, you know we are actually, uh, uh, you know, evaluate uh, how can we uh, improve our manufacturing process, you know, to really uh, reach the capacity, you know, uh, which is needed to power everybody's house. Um, again, as I said, within 10 years' time, I think all this will become, will become reality, you know, from manufacturing point of view. Doug, I would like I'd like to ask you, uh, you, you said that in the next three years, by 2010, they're going to increase efficiency by 20 percent, et cetera. Who's enforcing this? Is it possible? Can it really happen? It's a great question. You know, I think they, they missed the target in the first year. Um, it was expected. The, the central government said, well, we got started late. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, Energy efficiency is the cheapest form of, of new energy for China, uh, the, but at the same time, it's very diffuse, and um, it takes a lot of in individual actions at the local level. Getting local officials to follow central edicts is a challenge in China, um, and that, I think that is the most crucial challenge uh, facing the world, really, in its ability to curb global warming is the, the, you know, the monopoly discretion of local officials. So where is the leverage? And so one of the initiatives here is to, one, do training programs about what, what do the regulations say and what are the local opportunities for implementing cost effectively and in fact profitably a lot of these efficiency solutions. But can we also have environmental performance criteria ensconced in the annual performance reviews 
for local officials so that they have metrics for improving if they want to move up through the hierarchy uh, that they need to, to demonstrate environmental improvement and have this link to energy performance. But this is already April of 2007. If they don't get going soon, they're not going to meet the 2007 standards, much less the 2010. I'm just listening to you. And then there's 2015 and 2020. Yeah, well, so uh, this is the first <laughs> time China has put energy efficiency as a centerpiece of its five-year plan. Uh, and if they miss it, well, we're going to work hard to get it in the 2015 plan and just keep chipping away at this because this is really China's development path. It needs to be a low carbon development path. And in fact, the whole world has to do this. And why can't China be the manufacturing base of the green technologies that everyone needs? <laughs> why can't? You're right. That's a good question. But we can't solve it this afternoon, I don't think. Uh, let me ask Victoria, though. Victoria, you said that you pointed out uh, very delightfully that energy prices in China, gasoline prices in China anyway, are much lower than most other places in the world. Right. Will that problem be solved? Because it is a problem. And if it's solved by higher prices, will that lead to riots in the street? Um, yeah, as you can see from the slide, uh, it is a problem. But I think this is where, as, as China tackles the problem of how, how to how does it at the same time lower demand through some of the energy efficiency programs that we just heard about here, but at the same time increasing supply. So it is a challenge to try to maintain both. And in terms of liberalizing the markets, um, China has started on that front. I believe earlier this year, it took some initial steps to look at liberalizing um, gasoline to, to, uh, to, to see how, you know, how, how they can start slowly look at um, how to let the price float, but as you rightly point out, if done too quickly um, or not enough of uh, sort of the infrastructure behind it, um, it will cause social unrest. I think was it a year or two years ago uh, when world oil prices went through the spike during the summer driving season, you read about the, the, um, the queues lined up in Guangzhou uh, because of gasoline shortages. Now, if the, if the prices were let to actually move, um, you know, the high price would have discouraged some of that, that uh, the, the pent-up demand and consumption, if you will. So, go ahead. Um, China is considering an, uh, a gas tax currently. Um, you know, there's two, you know, technology policy really comes down to two things, taxes and quotas. And when it comes to fuels, you know, when, you're, when it's artificially cheap, how do you bump up the price through taxes and then use that increase for helping to create cleaner alternatives? So help buy down the cost of hybrid electric vehicles, for example, or put it into other green technologies. On quotas, that's the approach that China's taking on its national renewable energy law. Uh, it's requiring 15% of the market. So mandatory market share for renewable energy. That sends a signal to the market that if you ramp up production, there will be a market there. And this is how Dr. Schur's company can depend on a future market in China, although currently it's mainly a, a product for export. Um, well, Victoria, you also mentioned that, that China is around the world buying up energy. Uh, we all are aware of that. Uh, can they buy enough to solve their needs? And if they do, does that, does that lead to conflict with other countries, with Europe, with America, with Japan? Yeah, I think part of the, I mean, the biggest challenge right now is energy. Certainly, we um, recognize that the social and environmental aspects of, of energy, the consequences of not investing in clean energy. But on the flip side, uh, you know, energy is a very strategic national asset, not just for China, but for every country around the world, United States included. Um, so it, it's sort of a, a dilemma right now. Countries want energy independence in terms of they want to lower their reliance on imports. You see that in the U.S., you see that in China. So their, their approach is uh, let's buy up the reserves, the assets uh, offshore and then import it into China. However, I think uh, just recently, um, you know, I think it's starting to realize, for example, some of the investments in Africa, in, in troubled places such as Sudan, um, the Chinese government is pouring billions of dollars into the infrastructure of that country because it's not just to get the oil out. You have to build the pipelines. You have to build the storage. You have to build a lot of infrastructure in someone else's country. And 
at the same time, you have a lot of the, the, the political situation in some of these um, troubled areas of the world. Uh, you know, why not invest the billions of dollars, if you will, in your own backyard? Uh, what's interesting is, uh, uh, I believe just last month, there were some statistics that were published